Well, welcome everybody to uh, another uh, episode, Second Sunday Speaker Series. Um, we have this series every second Sunday of the month, as the name implies, and everybody's topics are related to nature. And in this case, we are just loving that we have Mike Crable with us. Mike Crable is considered by many to be the best forager of uh, one of the best, I should say, way up there though, of uh, wild edibles in recent times. And Mike is also known as Iowa's first county conservation naturalist. He was employed by Blackhawk County in 1967. Mike Crabo wrote the award-winning book, A Scout's Guide to Wild Edibles, and he'll be talking about that a little bit today. And that's considered to be the quintessential foraging guide. And in the Scout's Guide, readers learn how to locate and identify, uh, safely enjoy 40 wild edibles through color photos and positive ID tips for each plant. Recipes and do-it-yourself activities for all skill levels are included. So uh, by all means, get your kids and grandkids involved. Now, Mike recently published his delightful memoir. It's called A Forager's Life, Reflections on Mother Nature and My 70 Plus Years of Digging, Picking, Gathering, Fixing, and Feasting on Wild Edible Foods. Yes, that's all in the title. In this volume, Mike shares how his interest in nature and scouts and foraging was born, nurtured and polished. Today, Mike will share more of his wonderful life history, some of his wild edibles, his favorites, and more. And he has graciously offered a free copy of this, his latest book, uh, to be given away at the end of the presentation to a randomly selected viewer. Now, if you would like to ask a question, Mike will happily take questions at the end of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce a kindred soul, Mike Crable. Uh, welcome. Uh, I had a long, long interest in foraging. It goes way back to when I was a little kid and um, dad was into morel mushrooms and hickory nuts and black walnuts. And we went out, we gathered, we brought back, uh, we got together with relatives and we made things. And mom turned out to be a pretty good cook. And she used her little kid to uh, help with a rolling pin, uh, crack up the saltine crackers that she used and in adding to uh, the flavor of the morels in the morning, we'd uh, whip up some eggs and then, uh, dip the morels in um, egg wash and then roll them in cracker crumbs and saute them in butter. That was wonderful. <laughs> I could hardly wait to, to go out with dad. Uh, we were fortunate uh, later on as our family grew to um, wind up moving uh, on down to Kilcock and um, kind of spent my time there growing up and going to the YMCA and the YMCA had some people uh, that were uh, college age kids uh, that would come back home and work for the Y in the summer. And um, they loved to take kids out on hikes. And I was entranced. We spent a lot of time trying to stump them. And uh, fortunately they were uh, pretty hard to stump. They knew a lot about birds and a lot about trees and wild edibles of all kinds. and. Uh, showed us, I, I think, wild grape. That was the first time I'd ever had wild grape. Um, yellow wood sorrel, which is a pleasant sour clover-like uh, plant, and many others. Um, they also taught us about getting permission before we um, ran up on somebody's property and uh, grabbed some apples. <laughs> um, we actually would walk over to the door and knock on the door or ring the doorbell and we were amazed at how many times people said, help yourself. You know, we, we get these all over our lawn. Uh, we didn't realize that an apple tree would produce so much fruit, but yes, we'd be happy to have you enjoy them. So it was a good lesson uh, in uh, that sort of thing. So this is a close-up of the uh, Forager's Life book, 
So this one um, shows uh, uh, some of the larger tools that I would put um, as I got older and put in the trunk of my car or the back of my van and um, off I would go um, and collect with them. The ones that are like baskets, wire baskets in the middle uh, of the photo uh, actually are nut wizards. And the one that's the larger of the two with a tan colored handle is useful for picking up walnuts, uh, which is important, I found out. I once uh, made a mistake of trying to pick up walnuts with my bare hands. And oh, black walnut husk uh, in particular, it's an indelible dye. Okay, let's, let's go ahead and go on to the next one. All right, uh, you'll see a little decal on um, this book at the winner of the National Outdoor Book Association. And what it won in 2017 was the best field guide. Um, and one of the things that makes it a really good field guide, small enough to slip into a pocket, a jacket pocket, uh, cargo pocket, if you've got cargo pockets on any of your uh, clothing, uh, uh, whether they're shorts or long pants. And um, I, by the way, I'm recommending that uh, if you're going out hunting morels that you're wearing long pants instead of shorts. And the simple reason for that is ticks. We've got a big season for ticks now in Iowa, unfortunately. So you'll want um, insect repellent to go along uh, when you go out, but I also recommend um, instead of blue jeans, if you have light colored pants, um, ticks will show up e uh, better on light colored pants than they do on blue jeans. And if you've got a friend that can go along with you uh, after morels uh, or oyster mushrooms, whatever you're hunting for um, at that time of the year, you scan each other every so often uh, so the buggers can't get uh, up uh, a pant leg and, and get where you don't want them to go. I found that it's helpful to pull my socks up over the cuffs of my pants. It might look weird, but it works. Um, this book, uh, all, in addition to having uh, 33 of my favorite edible wild plants and seven of my favorite mushrooms, has um, projects and activities that I found great for groups, clubs, um, I taught for 35 years as a middle school science teacher, and the kids absolutely loved uh, some of the recipes that are in this book. So when I say 17 kid-tested, kid-approved recipes, they are indeed. And uh, we'll take a look at that right now. Let's go ahead. These are three clusters of berries that you find in September. They all grow on vines, um, up fences and up trees and uh, uh, over shrubbery. Um, you'll all find, find them uh, in stream valleys because all three of them uh, tend to like the, that area. One of them is um, wild grape and it's edible. Another one is uh, Virginia creeper and Virginia creeper uh, irritates your throat if you bite and chew on it. And the third one um, happens to be Canada moonseed. Canada moon seed is poisonous. It would take probably a cup or more of them, uh, so don't worry too much on that. Uh, but each one of these is um, something you have to watch out for, and that's one of the reasons for having a good field guide. Let's go to the next slide. These are two of the pages from this scout's guide, the wild grape, and if you look over to the right, uh, you'll see what those uh, berries were. The wild grape, Canada moonseed, and Virginia creeper. Each one of the clusters looks slightly different. And if you build a visual image of what you're looking for, wild grape, for instance, um, then you'll be more likely to not have any problems in separating it out from the other two. Canada moonseed has a really long slender um, stem and the, um, berries are uh, separated on it a little bit in, in distinct clusters. Um, Virginia creeper uh, spreads out and it has a magenta colored stem. Um, some of the kids have asked me when we've been out in field trips with our my seventh graders, um, Mr. Crable, can 
can you eat uh, Virginia creeper if we get them mixed up? And I said, they're not pleasant. Um, they make your throat sore. They irritate your throat. Could I try some? Okay, <laughs> yeah, but be ready to spit. And if you've got a water bottle with you, uh, you won't want to use that to rinse out your mouth. Uh, so uh, as a person tries, I urge people to move back in case he needs to spit. And sure enough, they do spit. <laughs> okay, uh, what can you eat on, in terms of wild grape, which are small and all of these um, are about the same size, They're about the size of a pea. Um, the Y-shaped tendrils that help pull the, the leaves up into the sunshine are sour. Uh, they're thirst quenching. And if you're out on a hike uh, or activity with uh, friends or even kids, uh, the Y-shaped tendrils are something that you can give them. Um, you want to make sure that the leaves look like maple leaves and that they are serrated uh, toothed around the outside edges that help separate them from Canada moon seed. Virginia creeper has uh, like five separate leaflets to it. So the leaves are other ways to distinguish them. One of the things that we made and uh, kids absolutely loved was wild grape jelly. And we made uh, hundreds and hundreds of baby food jars full, uh, probably 500 baby food jars full of it. And kids, um, Sometimes couldn't wait to take that home and share it with a family, and that was a shame. But um, I would see them uh, opening the jar of wild grape jelly that they were going to take home. They stick their fingers down inside, <laughs> like that, on the way home. Um, but besides wild grape jelly and the uh, tendrils, we found out that they made wonderful popsicles. Um, and in this um, section, uh, it talks about edible part and preparation. It says, to prepare a small batch for your family, try Jessica Garrett's recipe on page 164. Let's go to the next slide. Best place to eat wild grape popsicles is outdoors because the drips can stain things. And one of the things that stains is your tongue. So the girls are checking purple tongues. <laughs> It makes your tongue nice and purple for a little while and um, eventually will go away. But um, Jessica wanted to uh, have some extra credit. She was an A student and said, Mr. Crable, I'd love to have an A plus instead of an A, is that possible? <laughs> I said, well, yes. Um, if you could come up with a recipe that would make one tray, one ice scoop tray full of wild grape popsicles, uh, I'd like to know do we need a cup, two cups? What do we need in terms of wild grapes uh, so that people could create it? And she found out that you need one cup of ripe wild grapes, um, a couple of cups of water, and two tablespoons of sugar to sweeten it. And uh, she went through uh, the preparation several times to make sure of it. And I put in there about um, creating the cover. The cover of the popsicle tray there is um, basically cardboard <laughs> but the craft sticks work really well and uh, you need an adult i told the kids to use a, um, a paring knife and then push down through the cardboard into the cell below holding the cardboard in place with the uh, rubber bands so uh, we did that we followed the recipe we've put these in the freezer overnight so they were good and um, solid. And then we could take the rubber bands off and um, lift up on uh, the cardboard ends with our fingers and while pushing down with our thumbs on the craft sticks. And um, we were able to wiggle the cardboard cover over the craft sticks and kids absolutely loved it. it one of their favorite things that they made in seventh grade science that year. Well, let's, um, switch over to The Forager's Life, which is a bigger book. And um, it has 21 recipes. Uh, the previous book has 17. And all of these recipes are, were also kid tested and kid approved. Uh, part one, um, always a curious kid, always wanting to know things and find out about them. And when Ewell Gibbons book came out, uh, I know uh, Connie has a copy of it there. Um, Ewell Gibbons wrote in such a way that it was just 
such a, a pleasure to read. And um, I got into that. And as I had a chance to um, go down to visit relatives in Tennessee, my grandparents um, had different kinds of wild foods around them from those we would find in Iowa. Persimmons um, are rare in the state of Iowa. They're found in a few spots in southeastern um, Iowa. But uh, I saw some persimmons and um, I went on a scout camp out with a boy uh, in Tennessee. And he said, um, Mike, you've got to try one of these green persimmons. Well, I've never had a green persimmon before. And so I bit into it. Oh, it curls your lips and your teeth underneath. And it's just quite an astonishing thing. Uh, you, you want to wait until the persimmon is fully ripe. When it's fully ripe, it's orange. Uh, there's um, a black uh, leafy kind of thing up on top uh, that will twist off easily. Um, and it will uh, feel soft and it will feel uh, very much like you're um, pushing in on a water balloon. We had a scout camp not far from uh, Keokuk, Iowa, uh, over in Illinois, and I became a scout and went over there, and uh, there were staff members that uh, told us about Indian turnips, where, which were jack-in-the-pulpit that Native Americans used to cook up uh, and, um, and actually eat. And uh, I found out about them and I asked uh, the staff members, I, sa I said, uh, are those things edible? And, and they said, yeah, you can eat it. And so they said, uh, here, uh, we'll fix one up for you. Uh, use their pocket knives to pair the, um, the, the corn uh, of the jack in the pulpit off and sliced it up and put a chunk in there and gave it a piece, uh, they cut it in half and gave me a piece and gave my friend who was with me uh, a piece. We were both 11 years old at that time, new in scouting and not aware of um, the Indian turnip. Whoa, boy. Um, they said on the count of three, bite into it and chew it up. And on the count of three, we started and we stopped immediately and spit it out. It uh, has needle sharp raphides, which are um, pointed crystals of calcium oxalate in it that actually burn the inside of the mouth and stick in your um, mucous membranes and, and inside your mouth. And they're just nasty, nasty, very, very hot. And uh, we wanted to wash our mouths out with the water uh, from the nearby um, wash stand uh, at, at the camp that we were looking at. And they said, oh, that won't help you. And uh, they said, the only thing that will help is bread. And so we'll need to get right back up to the lodge kitchen and uh, we'll ask. And so we went up to the lodge kitchen, and knocked on the door and we need some bread, please. <laughs> and uh, the cook looked at the boys and she said, you did that Indian turnip thing, didn't you? Um, KP for the rest of the week. And uh, so she got us the bread and it did, it, it made a big difference. But uh, I learned that uh, you don't, that's not a way to bring a person into foraging and encourage them to eat things uh, it is to play a mean old trick on them. From uh, Scouts, I had a chance to become a staff member and had a great time as a staff member. Uh, I taught uh, the nature and conservation merit badges, went on to, uh, to Iowa State University got an education in soil and water conservation, which they called agronomy. Uh, I had not come from a farm before, but I had a big garden. Um, from Iowa State, I had a chance to um, work at the Audubon Camp in Wisconsin. And up there, the director said, Mike, what do you want to do for your future? Um, a question that all high school people should ask themselves. And eventually, of course, answers will change. But I, I said, well, I'd like to teach conservation education to people so they're aware of it. And I'm also interested in wild foods. And um, I would love to be a decent science teacher. The uh, director of the camp said, you need to go to Cornell, uh, Cornell University, not Cornell College in Iowa. And um, they actually have a program in nature study, science education, and conservation education. 
I was bound and determined to, to enter um, this profession of science teaching and nature study and uh, conservation education. So, and um, I earned a master's degree there. Um, part two says the naturalist year. So what happened was, uh, is documented in, in the book here. Um, and basically I had an opportunity that came in the mail from Iowa to, to my advisor. And my advisor said, um, when I was close to finishing up the written part of my master's thesis, he called me in his office and showed me this letter from Iowa. He said, Mike, this just came to me from the director of the Black Hawk County Conservation Board in Iowa. He and the director of the Cedar Falls Park Com uh, Commission are looking for a person who could become Iowa's first county naturalist. He went on to list the desired attributes for the position. Someone who would set up nature trails and parks, run programs there, train teachers in outdoor education, and take school classes on field trips. That person would also do programs for clubs and supervise youth groups and doing conservation projects and write articles uh, for newspapers and radio to let people know what was happening in the parks. I think it's an opportunity, my advisor said, to do something groundbreaking in your home state. What do you think? Wow, I said, it sounds like it was meant for me. His advice was to take the letter, call the director now, tell him I'm excited to hear about this opportunity and that I look forward to meeting him and the people who work for him and the Cedar Falls Park director. And that I would love to come out for a visit in an interview. And in other words, show enthusiasm. I made that phone call uh, instantly and uh, I got an invitation to, to fly out to Iowa my job interview in the late spring of 1967 was not quite what I expected. The Blackhawk County Conservation Board Director, Monique Johnston, greeted me with a hearty handshake when he came to pick me up at the Waterloo Airport. Let's go see some of our 19 county parks, he said. And away we went on a whirlwind tour. I was totally impressed. The first parks we saw were full of migrating waterfowl. At every turn on the road, great bunches of mallards and blue-winged teal, pintails, and redheads took flight, and they in turn triggered Canada geese. As we neared a stream, beautifully colored wood ducks leapt up to amaze us. Half-jokingly, I turned to Monty and I said, where do I sign up? He said, the, uh, this is the kind of thing that we want you to be able to interpret and tell people about its value, and well, in other words, it was um, something I knew how to do. I was good at identifying trees and I uh, had experience at scout camp and leading kids out and pointing things out and sharing ideas with them. Um, one of the th uh, things in chapter five that it's mentioned is counting eagles. And that might seem kind of strange, but I, um, I was back in Keokuk, I had signed up to help uh, count the ratio of immature to, bald, uh, to uh, adult bald eagles because uh, they were concerned that DDT was causing the eggs of uh, the eagles to crack as the adults would sit on them because the eggshell hormone uh, was causing uh, a thin egg shell. Um, I did set up uh, an eagle counting program in Kilcock and uh, got uh, school teachers and uh, kids and scouts involved for years uh, after that. So I said, uh, is it possible that the conservation board would allow me to set up an explorer post of high school age kids? And um, found out, yes, we'd be happy to do that, uh, specializing in conservation. And uh, we had a conservation um, uh, game game warden, uh, conservation officer for the DNR, um, join and, and become our associate advisor. I thought there, this would make a really good winter activity for the, the kids in the post. And so we had a, a, an old green school bus that the conservation board had fixed up. Uh, and I got a chauffeur's license and learned to uh, drive it uh, carefully and um, I talked the kids into giving up their Christmas vacation 
um, after Christmas. Uh, in other words, we took off in this bus and drove down to uh, my home in Lee County and from there over to the scout camp in Illinois. And uh, I had gain, uh, had uh, some, some friends of mine that served as the uh, chefs and uh, we had a, a great time down there with uh, sledding and um, we did some hunting uh, in Iowa on, uh, for quail and for rabbit and for squirrel. And we had a uh, fellow fix up uh, 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 Burgoo, which is uh, a Civil War era uh, kind of thing. And um, the kids loved it, absolutely loved it. We um, counted eagles the next day. And then I reported that uh, in the Waterloo Courier when I came back, as well as uh, sending um, mail off uh, to Iowa and getting it involved down there. Um, I served there um, for three years um, and built up um, nature trails around the area, including the one that I, uh, uh, that led to um, Hartman uh, Reserve. Uh, it used to be a Y camp, as uh, some of you may know, and it only had maybe 56 acres or so. And the kids in the neighborhood, um, I would see frequently because I love to play basketball out in the, the park, uh, not far from where I lived. And uh, I told them that I was going to be planning a nature trail for the Cedar Falls Park Commission and um, maybe tying it into what the Blackhawk County Conservation Board did. And so the kids followed me like I was Pied Piper and off we went and we took a look at what the land looked like and the fact that um, it was such a small area um, and there, the kids wanted to save certain parts of it. They had become very um, owner directed of that land. It was their land. And so I, one of my recommendations was that um, we acquire a more land um, along the Cedar River. Um, I'm speaking about the Blackhawk County Conservation uh, Board um, in extending the green belt. And uh, they also, um, I had suggested that they make use of uh, some excess roads as the beginning of trails so that they didn't have to um, do a lot of maintenance on the, the specific trail itself. Uh, I'm very pleased to see that was put into effect and that through the years we've had uh, a beautiful evolution of um, a great, great nature center, one of Iowa's best. Thrilled that Connie has an opportunity to work there as, as do the two Katie's. Um, I um, will mention that um, as I uh, got towards the end of my three years, there uh, I had an assistant naturalist and I had uh, worked in, with the schools um, and I was also uh, working with um, Ben Clausen, who was a professor, uh, an associate professor at University of Northern Iowa. He happened to have a conservation class and uh, a club. And he said, Mike, could you use some help uh, leading kids out in nature trails and when they come out to visit from the schools? And I said, absolutely. Um, I'd known him for a while. And he said, uh, let's do it. And we did that, and we also put on a, a teacher training event at Thunder Woman Park up near Finchford, and uh, really got heavily involved in conservation education. I received even a little bit of criticism from an editor, um, a columnist uh, uh, in the Waterloo Courier, who felt that the conservation board really was um, supposed to be only about recreation and had no business dealing with conservation education. Uh, I didn't agree with that. <laughs> oh, okay, um, but uh, I was looking around for other opportunities and had done a lot of things uh, uh, working as a naturalist. And so there came an opportunity um, in the state of New York since I'd gone to Cornell uh, at the Onondaga Nature Centers. Uh, this was uh, a place that was going to acquire land and then do educational programs there for 
uh, what was called uh, Board of Cooperative Educational Services, where there were 15 different um, um, school systems, school districts that were involved in it. I worked uh, setting up a, a, the Nature Center um, on a 300 acre area that had a 200 acre lake to it, lots of waterfowl again, and um, just a beautiful, beautiful site. And, um, and I trained um, a, a couple of people that, that came out as summer naturalists. Uh, I had a, a, a beautiful, uh, talented artist that um, uh, could uh, design nature trail guides and so forth and um, signs. And we worked hand in hand together. I uh, even had some people come out, believe it or not, from, um, from Iowa that had been associated with me out in uh, uh, Blackhawk County, um, including uh, a, a number of um, uh, photographers that uh, really added to our ability to um, carry the message forward. And so um, one of the things I didn't know that we would have to do was to raise money. And I was not really a money raiser except for the scout troop. And so um, I found out that uh, we were going to have to um, raise $65,000 a year. And that uh, seemed to me um, a pretty hard task. And we had a professional fundraiser come out and talk to us uh, from this New York City and um, we did what we could, but it was obviously that, uh, hard for people and they were getting kind of tired of having to raise the money. We had kids involved actually, um, doing a walk to save the county and taking uh, donations. And uh, it just wasn't my kind of bag, but they appreciated uh, what I had done for them. And they said, we're gonna need a different kind of director uh, with a business background. and. Um, you know, can put us on a solid founding uh, footing. And so I did that. And I, um, I said, um, I've been wanting to go to the University of Michigan and uh, learn about um, environmental education. They've got uh, one of the top people in the nation there. And I went out and met him and he, he suggested that I um, try to become a teacher because he was leaving on a sabbatical uh, to Paris uh, for three years. And he was going to raise um, uh, programs for 130 different nations around the world uh, from that office uh, for UNESCO. And um, I said to him, I said, Bill, I, I'd love to go with you. I wish I spoke French fluently. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I, I have a, a teaching degree from the New York State, uh, and I would love to uh, learn uh, what it's like to be a teacher. And um, I applied for the job in Ann Arbor, and unfortunately, Ann Arbor, um, where University of Michigan is located, had 2,000 applicants for this job. So I went away to um, another place and uh, found out um, that I could apply for a job of teaching ecology. I found out uh, by talking to the personnel director that um, this was, uh, I have to create my own course. The books were way out of date. They talked um, over 20 years old and talked about someday getting on the moon and using carbon tetrachloride, which is a carcinogen uh, for a uh, fire extinguisher. And um, so I sat down and with my background uh, in the outdoor education aspects of having been a naturalist and um, working in education uh, at Cornell, I, um, I wrote a curriculum Kids loved it. Um, parents helped out by uh, leading field trips. Uh, uh, older brothers and sisters who were in college uh, would help drive us out in field trips because the, unfortunately the district had no money and just barely could hire me. And um, at the end of the year, well, uh, everybody would give me all kinds of wonderful testimonies. I was pink slept and told Mike, uh, look elsewhere for a job, but if possible, I'll find some money, scrape it together and hire you. They hired me for one more year and pink slipped again. And then I got into a, a job uh, where a, a colleague was 
um, moving into from a seventh grade science teaching position into teaching gym and was looking for a replacement. And I filled that and stayed on for 30 years and um, loved it. I absolutely loved it. Won several awards and um, began working on uh, a PhD and so forth. And one of the days uh, after about 30 years, mom called me and she said, help, I've fallen and I can't get up. I need you to come home and take care of me. I thought, whoa, well, I'll see if I can uh, retire after 30 years. And I talked it over with our principal and our superintendent of schools and um, did, I bought a couple of years uh, and set up my retirement and off I went to Iowa and uh, back to Kilcock and uh, found out back here that uh, there was a teacher that was retiring uh, who had been teaching seven classes of science, all the same preparation. I have won out over quite a few other people because of the awards that I'd received and the good experiences I had in, in Michigan. I retired after um, five years of teaching there. Mom had passed away, but we had three good years together. And I, I loved uh, being able to help her out uh, during that end. So um, since then, I've attended uh, various conferences around the nation that are into wild foods. And at one of them, uh, we created the best wild beverage um, a few years back by taking wild black raspberries, creating a, a mushed up syrup from them. I wanted some of the uh, mouthfeel of the wild black raspberries in the liquid. And we used sumac to make sumac lemonade. Um, some of the parents were a little concerned that uh, the sumac was poisonous. And there is a poison sumac that grows in Michigan. It doesn't grow in Iowa. Uh, we found out later on um, that although it's not in but one book, out of the 300 books that I've got, I found that it, because it's related to cashews and mangoes and pistachios and poison ivy and poison sumac, the red-fruited sumac can also be poisonous uh, to people that are very, very sensitive. Let's quickly go through uh, dandelions, which you've got in your area big time now. We found out um, that the yellow part tastes good, but the green part tastes horrible. It's really, really nasty. The green part is called the receptacle, where the flower petals are stuck in and then it uh, evolves into the, uh, the um, stem. And if you eat the green part, it's horrible. The Scout's Guide to Wild Edibles, how to do that. And there's a recipe in there. It, it also shows how to roll um, the green part between your thumb and forefinger, pressing down, and so that you can actually pull the yellow part loose. Um, squeezing dandelions, it's called and here's three of my seventh graders that are fixing the dandelions. Uh, and we basically fried them up in uh, canola oil. And then we rolled them in a bread loaf pan that had um, powdered sugar or plain sugar or sugar and cinnamon. And the kids loved them. They absolutely loved them. Um, I found out too that there's such a thing as, uh, it's fairly easy made, easily made. It's a dandelion cordial. And again, um, you have to uh, separate out the green part from the yellow part, and you can add some sugar and some uh, water and uh, lemons and limes uh, for flavor, and then you can let it ferment. And it makes a fermented beverage um, that will have a fizz to it, uh, like a dandelion soda. Uh, you can stop it early if you've got kids or grand grandkids, or if you um, are a group of adults and would like to keep it going. Uh, you can uh, develop a little bit of alcohol with a, a pleasant taste. Let's talk about morel season and let's go quickly. I uh, happened to be uh, out hunting morels once, hadn't had any luck and stopped at a nearby gas station where I had stopped two years before and I'd asked, has anybody started finding morels around here? And they said, well, I don't have any reports. Two years before, one person was bragging that he'd found 60 pounds of morels. This lady caught up with me outside and she said, I'm a professional morel hunter. I do it for a living. 
And I'd be happy to uh, let you take some pictures if you uh, want. Uh, and I said, well, sure. And she gave me some advice on finding morels. And she told me that she'd been finding them for quite a few weeks already. And what she had done was to um, go south towards Missouri. Morels go north with the spring. I have a friend in, in Indiana that's well known uh, for uh, being a champion in morel hunting contest. And he and his wife take their camper and go down to North Carolina. They have kept a diary, uh, a journal where they have 700 morel mushroom fortunes, uh, so to speak. Whenever they go out, uh, morel mushrooms are everywhere in that particular area. And so through, through a period of time, they've narrowed this down to 700 sites. And they start in North Carolina and collect in North Carolina. They go to Tennessee, collect in Tennessee. They come up through Missouri, collect in Missouri, and they stop in Iowa and collect in Iowa. And by that time, they have amassed 200 pounds of morels. Now, a pound of morels is what would fit in a quart food container, a plastic food container. Uh, if you can picture that, um, the price has gone up. I was just online yesterday taking a look at some prices of morels that are on marketplace.com, which is a, a place where you can um, go nationwide and uh, depending on where you're located and you can sell things. Um, morels ranged up to $60 a pound believe it or not. And these are the morels that you'll find in Iowa. Uh, the Morcella angusticeps, also called Morcella elata. It has black ridges and that are almost in a straight line. Morcella punctipes, uh, which is uh, known as a half-free morel. And uh, there's not very much part of the morel there to eat except for the stalk and a little bit of the cap. And um, I don't particularly care for the flavor of it personally. Uh, so if you see this, I'd say, let it go uh, for the first one um, or for the last one, Morcella americana. Uh, Morcella americana is um, found uh, all over Iowa, and it's the most common of the mushrooms in the United States uh, of the 19 different species of mushroom, of morel mushrooms that you'll find. How do you tell a morel apart from other? You cut it open. The entire inside of the morel will be hollow. There won't be any cottony material or any stuffing or anything else. It, it will be hollow. That's how you tell that it's a morel. Um, and morels can get dirty pretty easily. So when you go to harvest them, take a, a like a little flay knife with you that has a sheath and carry it in your basket and then use it to cut the morel stem above the ground so you're not yanking them up and bringing dirt into your basket with you. This one is found in your area, um, not as commonly as morels, but when you see it, it it's very impressive. It's huge. Uh, it's called the big red or the brain mushroom, uh, the, the folds on top of it, give it that name. Gyromitra caroliniana. Um, and Alan Burgo is a forager chef that has tried cooking this up because many people do cook it up, but it can cause sickness or death. <laughs> so he was playing with fire. Uh, it has monomethyl hydrazine, which is rocket fuel uh, that outgasses when you're trying to, to cook it. Um, so you've got to be really careful with what you're doing. And I, I honestly don't recommend this, although I know a person here, uh, one of our former county supervisors, um, it's still alive, um, that has eaten this. This is a the other one that looks like a mushroom on steroids called the elephant ear or the saddle mushroom. I think you can see that from the shape. And um, that also has the same toxin in, and that toxin can also um, result in cancer and it's cumulative. So uh, leave these ones alone. If you cut down through them, you're, not, you're going to find out that uh, they're not hollow. Um, like the morels that you should be eating. Uh, this is a, a, a photo from the DNR website that has um, the Marcella Americana on it and 50 tips to spot morels. I wrote that years ago 
uh, for the Iowa Outdoors magazine. They liked it so well and people were asking so many questions that they put it on the website. And if you go to their website, the Iowa DNR website, you're gonna find 50 tips to spot morels. And uh, morels are, by the way, are found in every state, although Florida uh, doesn't have very many, uh, nor the uh, lower parts of Alabama and um, Georgia, but um, every state, including Hawaii. Six of the 50 tips include uh, imprinting, uh, where you uh, take a picture uh, of a morel or you print off a picture from the internet and you post it on your refrigerator, say, or your front door, uh, where you'll be going in and out um, all the time. And your brain then recognizes that pattern when you don't. When you're out there, uh, suddenly you'll get a little look again. Uh, positive affirmations are also fun. Uh, go ahead, morels, make my day. I <laughs> uh, Run and hide. I will find you. I Mike the morel man. Uh, weather is very important. And uh, 53 degrees Fahrenheit um, is the soil temperature you want. Uh, you want enough moisture. Um, that the morels, which are 95% moist, moisture, uh, or water, need that extra water uh, to really encourage them. Um, the warmth of the weather is important. Um, I would say 60 degree days for the most part and not too far below 50 degrees at night. Where to look? Um, if someone's foolish enough to tell you where to look, then like I did once, <laughs> then that's where you can look. But I recommend uh, stream valleys. Um, sandy soil is one of the first places we'll, where they'll warm up. They um, won't stay in an area that floods annually. Flooding maybe every three or four years. Yeah, okay. Uh, particularly in the higher benches or maybe in some um, oxbow overflow areas where there's a little bit of a terrace. Um, and by all means, take kids with you. The reason for that is that they are closer to the ground. They can see these little tiny things sticking up, okay? And um, my little sister, when, when she was, um, uh, I think from four years old on up to maybe nine or 10, uh, she was of the right size that dad loved to take her out hunting. And then we all benefited because she could spot them. And he couldn't, he was six foot one looking down on them and they kind of um, disappeared. Okay, if you are interested in learning more, there are wild food festivals across the United States. I've been to all of these and have um, done programs at all of them and keynoted and blah, blah, blah. But these are great places to learn and you always get food, wild food there. And sometimes you can help cook it up. So you can, um, Type in a search engine, wild food festivals, and um, you'll get information back on when and where they're going to be held. The closest one to us is the uh, Midwest Wild Harvest Festival in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Um, I've been to um, 11 of the 12 that have been held and um, got it going again uh, for my friend, uh, Sam Thayer, uh, who is one of the best known wild food experts in the nation. We have found out since I printed this up that um, the book uh, Forager's Life is now in digital format. And so if you are a Barnes and Noble Nook person or an Amazon um, person uh, that makes use of uh, the e-versions, um, they're now available. Um, and I, I hope that some of you will, may get around to um, uh, the Amazon Kindle or the Apple products or Barnes and Noble Nook, and there are many others out there now. But if there are some questions that uh, Connie would have time to um, share um, or make possible for you to uh, ask me, I'd be happy to ask those of you who can stay. So this is your contact info if people wanted to ever get a hold of you. Does anybody out there want to unmute themselves and ask Mike a question? That'd be great. Anybody here at Hartman want to ask a question? That would be great. Mike, I have a question. Okay. Um, this, this is Scott, it's your fault. I was wondering, uh, 
you were you were talking about the the deck and the pulpit uh, being Porn. yeah and the, the, the only way the only way to make that edible uh, is a way that um, Ewell Gibbons actually uh, reports on in stalking the healthful herbs and um, it is thoroughly drying it. It took him nearly six months to do it, but he said it was amazing. It tasted wonderful uh, at the end of that uh, full, full uh, drying. I wonder, could you, use, could you use a dehydrator to speed up that process? Or is it a degradation of the chemical that, that causes it to be edible after drying? It's a, it's a degradation of the uh, calcium alkaline crystals that are in it and um, they break down over a long period of time. I don't know that Ewell Gibbons actually made use of a dehydrator at that point in time or whether he did any trying to dry it in an oven, for instance, with the door open uh, at a low temperature um, or whether he put it on a, a, a screen and set it out in the sun. Um, what he did uh, do, he describes fairly nicely in, in that uh, book. He um, put it up in the attic. And um, I think he strung them up on um, thread and hung them uh, spaced apart in the attic. Um, you, I don't think it's in your um, uh, Stalking the Wild Asparagus book. I think it's one of his other books. Hi, Mike. Can you hear me? This is Candace Havely. Hey, Candy. So um, I got to um, do the fungi foray with you at Wikiup last Saturday, which was a lot of fun. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I've got a question. Can you speak a bit about the ethics of foraging? Like what's the, the, the rule of thumb about when you find that patch of, you know, wild ramps, um, you know, don't take them all, correct? Or don't take- Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Leave some. Uh, in fact, uh, many people who talk about using wild ramps um, in soups and, and stews and things of that sort um, actually prefer- using the leaves and the leaves uh, you can cut off and they can be used to flavor things and that doesn't damage the, um, the ramp itself. They are very flavorful. They also uh, have a big impact on a person's breath. Those of you who have gotten into ramps may know it used to be the sort of thing that um, were banned from country schoolhouses. If a kid came in and been eating ramps, that was a her invitation for a forced hookie, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, but the ramps, um, they recommend um, no more than uh, one or two from a, a cluster of ramps. And um, that if you are in an area that you visit other areas after you've done maybe um, gone to maybe three or four plants, uh, there are places where it's ridiculous to say that. They're, they're just all over the place, and it's wonderful to see that. I have one ramp on my property. Um, it's got several bulbs to it, and I haven't harvested it yet. I planted it about five years ago, and it, I planted it from uh, bulbs that I uh, harvested uh, from a, a plentiful area in Missouri. I know they're found in Iowa. Uh, northeastern Iowa seems to be especially um, good uh, at having ramps. And uh, they're found in Illinois, they're found in Wisconsin. I have friends in Wisconsin now that are selling them and um, I need to find out what they're selling them for because I'd like to purchase some and put it on my own property. Are there any other plants that you need to be careful about when you harvest them? And then also uh, I've, I grew up when we went hunting for morels, we were told, to take a, a net basket so spores could fall out. Right, well, there's um, some concern um, and some argument um, in the mushroom groups that um, it's probably best to harvest mushrooms that way to keep them cool so that they're um, on a hot day, especially if it gets up towards the 80s, that you're not going to ruin the morels. Um, morels, if they're put inside a plastic bag, it um, doesn't allow the moisture to escape. It doesn't allow spores to escape if, if they will. I have a friend here in the Keokuk area uh, that uh, I've known for many, many years. Um, I, his daughter was in one of my 
uh, seventh grade classes years ago. And um, he has some property that um, he reserves for himself, of course, uh, and for his relatives at this time of the year. And he said, Mike, I've never had so many morels as when we switched over to using mesh bags. Um, he uses a, a golf cart to get around. It's his property. He said, we find him in a lot of different places now. I think just the aspect of um, harvesting some and then carrying them around even uh, is going to spread the spores. A lot of people are thinking maybe the deer are doing that or the squirrels are doing that or so no, or wild turkeys are doing that. Not true. Not No, deer um, will feed on the vegetation that might be around the morel, um, but uh, they don't uh, feed on the morel itself. Native Americans have a, a really good um, system, and I think it's never take the, the first one, never take the last one. They have their own uh, way of harvesting sustainably, and Fortunately, there, there used to be a wild, uh, wild food summit is what they called it. And they did it for 10 years with their tribe's permission. And then after 10 years uh, time, they felt, well, we've done enough for the white folk and uh, uh, trying to share our beliefs and our customs. And, um, and so some of the tribe um, was still, I think, hurting from what um, people had done back in their history. Uh, but I'm glad that they uh, allowed me, at least, uh, to be part of the whole um, nine yards and to learn from them. Um, I, I do care for the land, you know, and uh, I want to make sure it gets passed on um, when, I, uh, when I'm gone. And that's one of the reasons for the books. Uh, in A Forager's Life, you'll find a whole section that, uh, of the book uh, towards the back of the book that's still devoted to that and to the wonderful uh, friends I've made and the lovely lessons I've learned about taking care of the earth, harvesting so it's sustainable, that it will keep on um, being ramps and um, ostrich fern and uh, many of the other things that we otherwise might harvest to the point of extinction. No, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Mike, is there any ID book that contains a lot of, I know you had quite a few in your books, and but is there an ID guide online or another pocket guide that has a more extensive selection of edibles? Um, I'm pretty much the, the only um, small ID book, it, and this has... Um, it's got 40 wild foods in it, 33 are wild edibles uh, uh, in terms of plants, wild edible plants, and um, seven are of the mushrooms that I find are easy to recognize and relatively easy to find. Um, the morels, I wouldn't say are relatively easy to find, but when you find them, it's such a thrill. Um, you know, mother load, ah! <laughs> It's, it's a lifetime memory and it's, it's a lot of fun and they do taste good. I mean, they're wonderful eating. And there's a recipe in A Forager's Life that my friend um, uh, wrote up for me, uh, Morel's Pasta Alfredo. So if, if people have any doubts whatsoever on okay. uh, what they have found, just leave it alone? Uh, yeah, that's probably a pretty good idea. If, if you want to, um, to know the three books that I would rate at the, uh, the top of the picking order, go to foragersharvest.com, foragersharvest.com. Uh, that is the website for good friend Sam Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R, and his wife, uh, Melissa Price, and they are the ones that run this Midwest Wild uh, um, harvest festival uh, in, at the end of September. Uh, it's magnificent. There, there were 198 people in attendance in 2019. Of course, they had to shut things down because of COVID. And um, they may not open again this fall, but maybe in 2022. Um, I hope to be around because it's a magnificent uh, venue 
and uh, people come from all over the United States and share what they know. Uh, I used I used to be uh, in an instruction um, person uh, when it came to wild edibles, but um, I'm now just happy to let younger people with new ideas and new recipes uh, come in and take over and happy to go along with them. Well, are there any other questions for Mike today? Well, let Unmute just, yourself and then the people here at Hartman, um, I know that your foraging program will uh, start in a few minutes if you'd like to go. I wish I was there to go along with you. <laughs> I, yeah, I enjoy Katie, that Katie sort of always thing. always shows a good time. Uh, Sam's books, by the way, um, if any of you want to make a quick note of titles, um, Forager's Harvest is the first book he wrote. The next book he wrote was Nature's Garden. It had far more pictures in it, and as his photo photography is um, better in that one. And the last one is Incredible Wild Edibles. And those are, like I said, three of the best books ever written uh, on wild edibles. And I, I should know, I've, I've uh, served as um, a technical editor for Sam um, when he wrote those books. And um, it's just, it's lovely. Uh, I mean, the, he is so knowledgeable um and so experienced and his last book actually has a, a few recipes in it but um he's not much of a recipe follower uh, by comparison to a, a person that goes out and buys a lot of cookbooks uh, but he'll suggest good combinations you know so i highly recommend um sam thayer um uh, foragersharvest.com okay Okay, well, thank you so much, Mike. We really appreciate your time. I'm sure everybody learned uh, a lot of things today and will keep their eyes peeled on the, the paths at Hartman. Um, I did have a winner today would be Linda Hawk. Um, she won the book. And so Linda, I, I know you're in the neighborhood. So if you wanna stop by sometime, I can give you that book. Um, Thank you. I'm thrilled. <laughs> I will use it. Congratulations, Linda. I hope Thank you enjoy you. the book. I will. Uh, I, hate, I hate to say it, but I enjoy reading it myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a memoir, and uh, I think there's a lot of good uh, seasoned advice and, uh, and learning by doing um, that I've accumulated through the years, and I think you'll find it useful. I will. Th thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I live it. immediately adjacent to Hartman. So I have oh, yeah. foraging Excellent. ground right next door. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I, I better get out there before you do then, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and one last thing I'd like to tell everybody that we will uh, put a recording of this up on the Black Hawk County Conservation uh, YouTube channel. And uh, that'll be up probably tomorrow sometime. So if you'd like to rewatch or recommend it to somebody, it'll be up there. And uh, have a wonderful day today. It's beautiful outside. Let's all get outside. And I'll see you next month for another episode of the Second Sunday Speaker Series. And thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Bye -bye. Connie. It's been an honor to be here. <laughs>